USCHO.com. Welcome to USCHO Weekend Review for Monday, February 19th, 2024. This podcast is sponsored by the NCAA Men's Division I Frozen Four, April 11th and 13th at XL Energy Center in St. Paul, Minnesota. Visit NCAA.com slash MFrozen4 to get your tickets today. I'm Ed Trefsker alongside Jim Connolly and Derek Schooley. What a bad weekend, and uh, by extension, maybe a couple of days into the week before, for the top 10 in the USCHO.com poll, 8, 9, and 2 collective record. I mean, before we jump into the individual teams, Jim, can you remember a week that was that bad, maybe outside of the first uh, week or two of a season? No, no. And that was what I was going to point out. Yeah, maybe early in the season when you're really just throwing darts at a dartboard when you're picking your top 10, top 20. Uh, come on. Like, this, you're established at this point in the season. You're not supposed to be below 500 uh, in over a, what is that, 19 games. 19 games and you... you a below 500 record. And in that we're going to, we'll see that uh, four teams in their swept. So eight of eight of the wins came out of sweeps, all the rest of them. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. And probably the one that jumped out at me was North Dakota getting swept by Colorado college. We talked before about uh, CC going into Ralph Engelstad Arena and having a pair of 3-2 overtime wins. But these were uh, real thrashings both nights at Ed Robson Arena. I watched, uh, I got a chance to watch the third period of the, the, first, the first game and uh, about half the second game. And it was, it was, it was really one-sided. Obviously, uh, when you're trying to uh, get through the third period, but I think it was 5-1 going into the third on, on Friday. And then uh, Colorado College exploded on Saturday. These were thrashings, and they were, I think, Colorado College, uh, to quote Nuke Lelouch and Bull Durham, announced their presence with authority. I think if I've read this right, and this is all, all off uh, social media, but I believe this is the first time that Colorado has ever swept a season series against North Dakota in all the years that they've been playing them. And that's four wins. I know two of them come in overtime, so you didn't get all 12 points out of it, but still, uh, this is... It's it's one of those things where if North Dakota now faces them in the tournament, how do they feel? You know, is it one of those, well, you can't be a team five times in a year? Or is it, oh boy, here we go. Here, here comes this team again. The one team in the country that can seemingly manhandle us. That's that's something to coach all. That's a coach speak there. Oh, there's no way that a team can beat us five times in a year. Why? They beat you more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, hey, if we get RIT in the playoffs, I'll be using that one for sure. <laughs> And by the way, how about uh, CC in the NCHC standings moving all the way up to third place? You know, obviously you start winning games. That's what's going to happen. The, the bigger, and I know we're going to touch on it a little later, but they, they're now 11th in the pairwise. I mean, this is a team that, this was not one of the teams we were thinking about as, as an NCAC, AHC represent representative in the uh, NCAA field. And here here now they're, they're almost, I'm not going to call them a lock, but they're in a lot better place than a ton of other teams uh, that are out there right now. Another sweep on the weekend was Wisconsin. They actually picked up the Badgers, did one point in an overtime loss on Friday, but they went into last place Ohio State in the Big Ten and lost five out of six points, maybe ending their hopes for first place in the league. But uh, that was a pretty big setback this late in the season for Mike Hastings' Badgers. And it kind of surprised me that, I mean, that one really, that was the one that probably shocked me the most. I mean, obviously CC had done it um, before to North Dakota, um, but you know, Ohio state just hasn't been playing that great of hockey. Um, they get that Friday win in overtime and then, but then they kind of, they handled Wisconsin pretty well on Saturday. And, you know, now you're in Wisconsin. I, I don't want to say that you've handed Michigan state, the, the championship, there's still a lot of hockey to play in the Big Ten. Um, but they're in they're in the pole position now and they're ready to go. And Wisconsin, it's, it's going to be a tough climb back. They, again, didn't get they didn't get that decimated into the in the pairwise. Um, but 
it's still you're surprised when you have these losses this time of year. And Derek, maybe you can answer it. Sometimes coaches don't mind, you know, kind of laying an egg this time of year, but you, you, you'd rather do it instead of running a 25 game win streak into the playoffs. And then that's where you have your, your one blip, you know, is it better maybe just to, to have a, a little bit of a falter at this point in the year? Well, I think, I think it comes down to the fact is how are you playing? You want to be playing your best hockey and, and that can't and judge on wins and losses sometimes, I think is a, is a little bit different. So I think if, if you're playing, playing well and losing, uh, then, then okay, uh, that happens. You know, uh, the old saying is I'd rather win ugly uh, than lose pretty at the, at the time of the year of playoffs probably doesn't really take effect because you do want to be playing your best hockey. And um, that was a surprise to me. Um, you know, uh, usually when you you click on the social media and Twitter, you look at at scores and things like that. The one thing that popped out to me was that open ice hit in the Ohio State game. Uh, that uh, that was a big hit. That was a, a and it didn't go. I don't think it was penalized. I know it wasn't a major. No. But those those are the hits right now that just because they're big, they're loud. They usually tend to get called. And uh, I was really surprised at when I saw it and watched it on four different angles that that wasn't called, but that kind of blew up social media a little bit. And then you look at the scores and you're like, wow, because like you said, Ohio state has not been playing their best hockey. And um, I don't know if it's a blip in a Wisconsin's radar, but I mean, if you look at their last four, they've only won or the last six, they've only won two in regulation. So you've got to get right in a hurry and you got Penn state. And then obviously you'll get it extremely jacked up by Michigan State, but you got to get right in a hurry and you got to start playing your best hockey. Another one this weekend was Maine getting swept at New Hampshire. Jim, earlier last week on our USCHO Edge podcast, we talked a little bit about how Maine perhaps was showing a little more vulnerability than they had early on. Not totally invincible, but uh, my goodness, New Hampshire really took it to them. Ben Barr said they got a good old fashioned butt kicking. Yeah, I, I don't know that either game felt like the final score of 5-2, but they were both 3-2 late. Um, you know, and H added an empty netter on Friday and then scored a late random goal um, to make it 5-2. Saturday, it was 3-2, and then U and H scored the final two goals um, without the uh, benefit of the empty net. Um, so maybe that, that one felt a little bit more like the butt kicking. I think that was when Ben Barr made that statement. Um, but listen... Right now, Maine's showing, showing a little bit of a chink in the armor, you know, and um, and New Hampshire, which is a team that I don't really see a path to the NCAA tournament without winning Hockey East. But that was that they were a darling team earlier in the season. Obviously, they, they opened up with a win over Boston University in the first night of the year. And then the next week, upset Quinnipiac. Um, and everybody at that point was saying, OK, maybe this. UNH team is for real, but after that, they they won games, but they didn't have those statement wins. As as I was talking with my broadcast partner Tyler Mario on Friday night, if they won that game, it would be their third biggest win. And well, they won it, and it, it became their third biggest win. And the next night was their fourth biggest win. So uh, maybe they're starting to play their best hockey, or or at least returning to that form that they had early in the season. Um, so they could be a really dangerous team in the tournament, but I still look at Maine and like a lot of what they have. I, I just feel like if you shut down certain players, uh, the Nando brothers being uh, two of them, if you shut them down, then the offense needs to find some ways to create from the, the second and third lines. They have the ability. They just weren't doing it this weekend. And you follow this league, Jimmy. So I don't really want to, I hate to always, I hate to disagree with you because this is obviously your league, but you said Maine starts to show a little chink in their armor. They are four and four really kind of in their last eight. It's not like they're two and six. It's that one of those was an overtime loss. I think you're really going to see where they're at this weekend. You've got Northeastern who's coming up, winning the bean pot, feeling real good about themselves. Um, like I said, they, they split with Northeastern, they beat and then lost in overtime to Providence. And then this weekend, maybe this is the last weekend. The difference I think you're going to start to see is 
they got six games left before their playoffs. Other teams are going to their playoffs right, right. away. Uh, we've got our last weekend right now coming up in Atlanta hockey. Then we've got playoffs. You've got to be right. They've got a little bit of time to be right. We talked about that with Wisconsin. Wisconsin's got, got four games left. And I think that's where you're going to see everybody a little bit different, you know, when you're playing your best hockey. Uh, they're not in playoff mode. Uh, us in Atlanta hockey and battling for playoff spots and all that. We were in playoff mode a couple weeks ago. And uh, they're going to get there with this weekend with Northeastern. Looking at this past weekend, you've got only BC with a Friday, Sunday home and home with UMass, uh, Denver over Minnesota, Duluth, Quinnipiac uh, with a sweep of Union and RPI, Colorado College with a sweep of North Dakota, uh, big sweeps on the weekend. Um, of those sweeps, what's the biggest one uh, impact wise on that? Is it BC uh, against a pretty good UMass team? I think so, because it knocked UMass out of the, uh, the pairwise. Uh, they're right off the bubble right now. And this is a UMass team that we're not too, too many weeks away from considering them, you know, maybe could, they could get up to a number two seed. Uh, there were four, got up to a three, and you were thinking, hey, if you, pick, you can pick one up against BC and you become a number two seed. Well, they're going, they're going the other way. They're not even in the field as of right now. So that's a, that's a big step down for UMass. Um, so I think that uh, BC... And the BC has solidified themselves. This, they are playing the best hockey right now. Their power play continues to roll. So I think that that one really stands out to me. Although we've all also talked about Quinnipiac needing to get right. Uh, so Union and RPI appearing on their schedule at home didn't hurt. And, and, pulling, and, they, and they handled both of those teams easily. I, I think I want to say it was like six, two, seven, two, something like that. They, they, they wallop them. So they, they did a good job of taking care of business. Um, and they probably feel like they have to be, they, they've gotten right now at this point. Yeah. yeah I think they're, that, that, I think that was the, the great thing about the late games the other night. You got the North Dakota game that was late against power college. I thought the, uh, the Denver game, the end of the Denver game on Friday was outstanding. And I think the, that's a team right now. You talk about teams that are, are, are getting right. Denver got, Duluth came back and got got that late goal and then had to go to overtime, which is a, a big deal for them. I think there's a lot of things that are happening right now all over college hockey. And teams are going to have to, like I said, play their best hockey right down the stretch. And if you don't, um, you're going to go in the playoffs limping or as coaches like to say, leaking oil. And you don't want to be leaking oil uh, heading into the playoffs. And teams got to start getting right right now or you're going to see UMass drop out, Colorado College. Line. And then the other ones that are right in the bubble, and we're going to talk about a little bit more. I think th those are the guys that need a big end of the year stretch. Well, we just talked a little bit about the pairwise impact you brought up about UMass and about Colorado College moving up. What's interesting to me is how some teams can get swept and have very little impact, and others, it's devastating. North Dakota, Wisconsin, and Maine stayed within a, a place or two, or, or maybe I think in the case of North Dakota, maybe they just moved down one, one spot. Uh, Wisconsin did move down a couple out of a, a number one seed to a number two seed right now with that. But uh, you see UMass devastated and you see these other teams really barely affected. Well, here's something that I read it on social media and then I've just looked it up and it's, I'm not sure that the math exactly works out, but it basically does. You have as much separating the ninth and 10th team in the pairwise as you do separating the 10th and 16th team in the pairwise. That's, a, that's, that's really significant. So what that says, if you're top nine right now, you're feeling really good about yourself. It's going to be hard for anybody below to climb and take you over. But if you're down below nine, you're in a fight for your life. And it's, and it's, you're talking about, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 are all that's going to get in. Maybe even 14 doesn't make it. Then 15, 16, 17, these are teams. 17 at New Hampshire, I don't even think they can get in unless they, they basically have to run the table the rest of the way. So if you're talking about teams like Michigan or UMass, Cornell, St. Cloud, Providence, there's no room for error. You make any slip up in these next few weekends and you find yourself dropping below the bubble line below the cut line and and 
looking at from the outside in and then hoping maybe you could be in tournament weekend, final weekend, hoping for help that somebody has to lose in this miracle scenario to get you in. So that's that's where we are, I think, with the pairwise right now. Top nine teams are feeling really good about themselves. I was going to bring up, you brought him up, Cornell. How bad is that, the, the tie that they're having against the EL right now? That's, that could be one that, you know, we always talk about ties in the beginning of the year and things like that. But I mean, Yale's, Yale's a team they should have beat. They're 45th. I think we talked about what a couple of weeks ago where we said Cornell's in a position where they could run the table. Well, they, 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 they've done their job after beating Quinnipiac. But then they, they, they tied Dartmouth. They tied Yale. They're going to need to finish up. They can get healthy against Union RPI at the end. But uh, they're, in a, they're in a precarious spot right now where they're at. And they might need some help, yeah, too. I mean, no room for error, certainly. And then the fact that they're going to North Country this weekend doesn't make it any easier. You know, that's hard. That's hard. For, that's a, that's that's a, a really hard tough trip. trip. You know, even if you feel like you're better than both teams. And the reality is, is that St. Lawrence and Clarkson have had good wins over teams in recent weeks. So you're in a real tough situation. You're right. The union RPI weekend at home to close might be what they need, but there, there, there's no way that Cornell can probably get into the tournament right now without getting to Lake Placid. But how does that ha- like? And we talk about that. Uh, I think a loss against and you guys correct me. You're the pair, pairwise geniuses and all that. Um, but would a loss in the North Country? You can't make that up. But a win at home against Union and RPI. Not. The win no. at win, the win at the win at home against Union and RPI is is almost a must. It, you know, you, oh, absolutely! Because you, you can't lose those points at home. Um, you know. If you lose one in the North Country or you don't get all three points both nights, um, it doesn't help you. Um, you the, the whole thing with the ECAC is you have the best three playoffs. So you get a couple of ch- get, get a chance to get a couple more wins um, in one round of the playoffs, you know, as opposed to like a hockey East where it's only one game gets you to the semifinals if you're if you have the bye. So um, I, th- I, I, just, I, I I'll stand by what I say. If 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 Cornell doesn't get to Lake Placid. They, they don't have a chance to uh, to uh, get to the NCAA tournament. And, you know, that that North Country trip, one team that is really battling for position right now is Clarkson. They've only got a two point lead over fifth place union for the final first round bye. And in that league, those are really important. Uh, Cornell still uh, within range of Quinnipiac, but uh, that tie did not help. They got the extra point, but still. Uh, there is a big battle for position in ECAC with a first round buy. Yeah. And obviously everybody always looks at, at playoffstatus.com to see what they're, where they're at and all that. And you look right now, Cornell is currently 73%, but if they went out, they're 98%. And so I think that you've got a lot to, a lot to look at. And they actually have more of a, a chance right now than St. Cloud and Providence. So I think they've got a, kind of take care of their business and and they they've got it at 98 percent if they went out but 73 currently well with that we'll take a pause we've got more to talk about with the pairwise we'll also look at the playoff race in the ccha which is pretty fun to watch right now and we've also got a milestone to celebrate this podcast is sponsored by the ncaa men's division one frozen four april 11th and 13th at xl energy center in st paul minnesota my hockey fans at welcome to fandom 101 it's ncaa ice hockey championship time when the hottest teams in the country face off under one roof be there to see your squad hoist the ultimate trophy overhead the ncaa men's frozen four april 11th and 13th in st paul minnesota attendance is encouraged passion is mandatory buy your seats today at ncaa.com slash mfrozen4 class dismissed We're back with USCHO Weekend Review. Let's talk a little bit of pairwise. It's, it seems to me a little late in the year to not have more teams locked, which tells you what a great year it's been. But there's one team right now, Jim, that has 
is a complete lock no matter what. Boston College, really the only team uh, mathematically 100% in the NCAA tournament. Uh, you're right. I feel like usually we're in the four to five range by now and we're close. You will, you know, I'll, I'll kind of skip ahead here and you met, you know, BU, North Dakota, Michigan State, and Denver, they're all better than 99%, but they, I can't say that they're 100%. So you're so saying, saying there's, there's a, chance. a chance. Yeah, exactly. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting movies you know, today. You, you, you really have a, a bad stretch, baby. Suddenly you're, you're out. I, you know, it's just so... You're, you're pretty much in. Even Wisconsin and Quinnipiac, they're both exactly 99%. They're... You know, I, I even like, you know, I, I said it that if you go down to nine right now, you probably feel pretty comfortable. Minnesota. Minnesota 98, at 98. 98 that's pretty, locked, that's pretty yeah. good. It's after that. That's where everybody um, starts to get a little bit hazy. And I think that, you know, you can look at Colorado College. We mentioned them already. They're at 75. We mentioned Cornell at 73. But you have any stumbles if you're a Cornell um, that 73 goes away really quickly and Colorado college. Um, they have a little bit more opportunity to go either way. When you really think about it, they have extra weeks, just like hockey East. You have a longer, you have a lot more left in your regular season. Um, and then you have some playoff, uh, you know, rounds, you know, not as much if, if you're a, a 10 seed and in, in certain leagues and you're playing a best of three and then a, another best of three or something like that. You know, then there's a lot more games out there. That, but we're getting down to the point that teams have less than 10 games to make their case for the NCAA tournament. And most teams are getting inside of that six to eight, maybe even less than that range. So um, we're, we're, we're figuring things out. But anybody that is in that 10 and below spot in the pairwise right now. Um, so that, I guess, will be... Western Michigan, Colorado College, Providence, St. Cloud, Cornell, UMass, and Michigan. Uh, listen, boys, you, you're uh, you're on the clock. There's not a lot of time to make up where you're going, or unless you plan to win your league championship. Yeah, and then that's the best thing about uh, about this. I mean, you're looking at Western. They're probably a cup with the NCHC with the strength. They're pro- with strength of schedule. Wouldn't you say that they're just a couple wins away? You know, they've got a, this is a big weekend against St. Cloud. I mean, this is, this could go a long way in determining, followed by North Dakota. And then two, they've got to win against Miami if you're Western Michigan. But this, this could go a long, this weekend could go a long way here for, for a lot of teams and, and where they fit in. And you just look at, at teams that are, like you said, on the cusp. Providence is, is a team that's got to, they've got Lowell. They've got to win Lowell. They've got to beat Merrimack. These are games that they've got to win against teams that have losing records and then they finish up with BU and Northeastern. So there's, there's some big games coming up here to, to finish the regular season. Like you said, hockey East doesn't have a long playoff where they, you can make up a lot. So I think that there's a, there's, there's gotta be some urgency with some of these teams. I think. On the other end with hockey East with single elimination, you don't lose a lot. You're not going to have two losses added to you if you get swept in this or if you get beaten in this series that that's true and and that has some impact um you know you don't have as much room to fall you don't have so if you're a team in inside that you know top 10 and, you, and you're from hockey East, you're not going to fall you know that you're, you're not going to nosedive although um you know umass probably is wondering how they fell so quickly this week um against the number one team in the country again that just shows how how minute the differences are between those teams from 10 to 16. Um, but at the same time, if you need to make up ground, hockey East is not the right league to do it. In. I, and I, I don't know that we really have, I guess the ECAC might be one. If you end up not getting home ice and you have to go through two rounds of best of three. So you get four wins to get to Lake Plast. Say you're the fifth place team in ECAC, but we're not even talking about that because Cornell is not going to be the fifth place team. They're probably going to be the second, maybe third place team. So anybody that's in that place is not fighting for an at-large bid. So I guess we really don't have a lot of leagues where we can make things up at this point. Um, The Big Ten even, there's not enough time to, in a tournament to make a lot of ground up. How about NCHC? There might be some opportunity there. Just, you know, you have your quarterfinal round. um, And, you know, and going back to what you were just talking about, Derek, Western Michigan 
you know, they're, they're not just fighting for their NCAA spot. They're, they're not even in a home ice position right now. Uh, they need to find a way to, to overtake Denver or Colorado College or St. Cloud to get up into the top four and, and not be on the road uh, when they start their playoff series. But do you like that? Because then the pairwise implications of losing are, aren't as bad because you're on the road. And if you can take at least one, the pairwise implications are even I, I was massive. going to. I was going to take the more positive. I was going to take the I mean, positive view of that. Is if you are on the road and you get a couple of wins, uh, road yeah. wins in the playoffs, that that yeah. helps you a little bit. Yeah, it's 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 right now, and and only the computer knows. But those are those are things that, and obviously you're going to play every right. game to win. I mean. And you're going to play every game to win and, and you're not, you want home ice and you want to give yourself the best chance to, the more wins, as Tim Dennehy used to say, you want a better pairwise, yes. win hockey games. So, so win hockey games, that's what it comes down to. But I think there are those, those, those pairwise, uh, little, little things within the pairwise that aren't going to kill you sometimes if you have to go on the road and, and lose hockey games if it, if you're going to lose, you better lose on the road. Well, and it all really comes down to the RPI at this point within the pairwise. There's going to be a position or two that may swap because of head-to-head or common opponents. And this late in the season, you're not going to be able to change much in your strength of schedule. That's not going to move much. So you're exactly right. It comes down to winning games, and that's the only thing that you can control right now is your winning percentage. It only counts as a quarter of the RPI. But when you're talking about ten thousandths of a point separating teams in the RPI, uh, those those wins, those uh, road wins, not getting a tie and getting a win, those are those are all significant in a big way right now. One that we haven't talked about that's kind of on that cusp, and I'd like your guys' thoughts on it. What about Nebraska Omaha? They've got fifteen wins. They've got six games left with plus playoffs. They could be a twenty win team. And be on the outside looking in. It's certainly possible. Um, I don't, you know, you know, just looking at the the computer math on it, they're they're at best sixteen percent to get in right now. I, I'm comparing them to UNH. UNH is even has a better chance. And I've been saying that UNH doesn't really have much of a chance to get there without winning their conference tournament. It's 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 a it's a it's a big climb for Nebraska Omaha. Um, and they're at eighteen. It's not like they're at 25 they're Correct. at 18 we're not, not not much where colorado college wasn't much worse than yeah, that we're, a we're weeks not, ago. i guess that's the what this is a different year it feels like for the pairwise where we're not talking about teams down at 18 19 20 anymore we're talking we're really talking about uh, maybe to 17 and I, as i keep saying with new hampshire i'm not sure that new hampshire has an easy path in without winning their, the hockey's championship nor does michigan nor does Michigan. I mean, it, Michigan at least had, you know, could find some wins in the Big Ten, you know, here down the stretch. And then they get their their tournament. They're not going to uh, get any sort of a, a buy. They're going to have to play right from the from the first round all the way in. Um, but they have Notre Dame this weekend. And then they they close out at Minnesota. That's a chance to pick up some points. Um, but it's not, you know, nobody has an easy road right now down at the bottom. And if you're below that cut line right now, it's getting even more difficult to get back in. That's why those losses for UMass probably feel a little bit more significant for Greg Carvel over the weekend, especially uh, Sundays where he had a couple of leads uh, in that game. Uh, 3-2 and I think 5-4 or 3-2 and 4-3, I think they led. So, you know, it's, it's, those, are, those are games that you feel when you lose those games. And he was mad too. He was he was mad. <laughs> At least if you're UMass, uh, you are within a reasonable distance in the RPI of the teams above you. But you get below New Hampshire, there's a big, big gap for New Hampshire to Omaha, and then it continues to go down from there. Those teams, uh, I I just don't see any of the teams in that range being able to to catch up to. Uh, even where Cornell sits at number 14, it's just way too big a gap right now in the RPI. I, I don't disagree. You know, and in, in, in New Hampshire going into this past weekend, I didn't think New Hampshire had any chance. Now they sweep Maine and they've at least given themselves 
you know, a puncher's chance, 32%, you know, that's 27% as an at large. That's not bad, but that's a long way still too. That you, you're talking about no room forever. You're talking about finding as many wins as you possibly can. You're talking about getting to the final four in your conference tournament. Well, let's talk a little bit about league standings, especially when we look at leagues where you've got to win to get in. And the, the league that is really fun to watch right now is the CCHA. Things have gotten a little bit more even with the number of conference games played. Only Lake Superior State and Ferris State have 21 games, everybody else with 20. So these numbers are all on par with each other. And you've got Bemidji uh, at 37 points with St. Thomas Bowling Green and Minnesota State with 35 points. It's not like one team has run away with it like Minnesota State has done in recent years. And this is going to be a fun one down the stretch. But Derek, let's highlight one team out of that that has come back from a really slow start and is on fire now, and that is Bowling Green. Yeah, we talked about it before the show here, and we played Bowling Green early. They had so many different uh, issues. Uh, Ty Eigner was out. Curtis Carr did a great job of, of manning the ship through all that. But if you look, they kind of started to hit a little bit of a run here. They had a tough, tough December and beginning of January. They went five in a row and then came out and split with Minnesota State and since then have been red hot. Sweep of Ferris, sweep of Lake Superior, and then they got five of six points this past weekend to, to put them, vault them right up there in the, in the top, I guess, what, the top four? Or top three were tied, for, tied with Minnesota State, but I didn't see that coming. And I think that we were kind of a, uh, just... We got once we got past all the the issues that that was going on with the program, we kind of thought it was just this down year for them, and they were gonna have they they would have to kind of figure it out. But they have credit to credit to Ty Agner, especially after a a, a rough start, and then going through with that six five game losing streak, six of seven, to now put this little heater together and. Now, who and lo and behold, do they have coming into to Bowling Green, Ohio this week is Michigan Tech. And uh, their former player, Austin Swankard, did not play this past weekend with Michigan Tech due to injury. So it'll be interesting to see. But I know Bowling Green and their fans have probably had this weekend circled for a long time. So it should be college hockey with the student section that's as rowdy and as passionate as Bowling Green at its best this weekend. So it... Uh, that that's the one I'd like to highlight. I know Jimmy, you you were going to probably go in maybe a little bit different direction, but Bowling Green has done a great job of of diving back into this race. Yeah, you know, between them and Bemidji, you know, I I I write the bracketology column, and you know, for the teams for the leagues that don't have teams inside the cut line, we always put a placeholder for the, the team that's the league champion. And there was in the comments section, there was so many comments saying, "There's no way Bemidji State can win the CCHA." And, you know, I had to point out that they have the best winning percentage in the CCHA right now. So, yes, they could win the CCHA. I don't think that a lot of fans out there uh, believe in them a lot. They have a great series at St. Thomas coming up this weekend. Um, and then they finish with Minnesota State. So you want to talk about, you know, just differences in schedules there. Bowling Green has two teams in the bottom three that they're playing, whereas uh uh, Bemidji has to play two teams that are tied for second place right now. So uh, it's interesting. You got to take care of the business that you're supposed to take care of. Um, but in terms of strength of schedule, you almost feel like Bowling Green could have, could totally sneak up and win this league. Um, if they can pull off these four wins, if they get 10 out of 12 points in the last four games, would you probably be a betting man and say that they probably win the, the regular season? And right now, I would say that Ty Agner uh, uh, could be, you know, him between him and Tom Saratori, the two guys that are favorite of coach of the year in that league. Undoubtedly. Yeah. yeah. And, but, I mean, they, they're they doing uh, to come back. And I always love the Bowling Green Twitters with uh, Scooter, their equipment manager, one of the biggest uh, characters in the in the in the game doing the diamond cutter after sweep. So it uh, it's always good to see a sweep from Bowling Green, except if you're playing them. So I'm. I'm excited that we didn't have to have to 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 see that, but uh, they are really hot right now, and kudos to them. And but 
that's a tight race. I mean, you've got four teams within two points of a championship. And some I mean, of them, one game changes it all. Yeah, some of them got to play each other. So it'll be, it'll be a fun race to watch down the stretch. We've got time for just a quick hit on the other two races you mentioned in our notes, Jim. Uh, NCHC and Atlantic Hockey. Colorado College really brought that whole uh, pennant race, so to speak, in the NCHC down to earth. North Dakota just a one-point lead over St. Cloud. CC four points back of first place. Denver trailing Colorado College by two points. And then Western Michigan just two points behind Denver. This is going to be a fun one down to the wire. Yeah, you know, they have a few weeks left. They have an extra week in there, uh, which does make it, you know, there's a lot of hockey to be played there. It's maybe we don't, that, that was why I wasn't going to, you know, highlight team by team everybody in that league because there is some, so much that can change. But you're right that that one series, uh, North Dakota getting swept uh, on the road by Colorado College really did change everything. If, if it goes the other way, you're, you're, you're now, you know, handing North Dakota the regular season championship. Um, they, they, they pretty much could have locked it up right there, but now that they, they get a zero point week and a lost weekend, suddenly you have everybody in the mix. It feels, and you, you know, five team race for first place here with, with six games to go. That's, that's a lot of fun. Meanwhile, Atlantic hockey, it's a two horse race for first place. RIT needs, needs one point in its remaining two games to have a no worse than a tie for first place with Holy Cross. The Crusaders have been on a tear. They've got one game left at home on Thursday against Bentley. Uh, a loss there or or even just uh, one point in that one takes them out of contention for it. So that all boils down to, and Derek, you know what that's like, battling for position, uh, trying to be one of the top five teams to get a first round by, being top four to get home ice, or just getting six, seven, and eight in the league to have home ice for the single elimination first round game. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one. And Holy Cross has done, I mean, they've been hot lately and they've made a good little run. You know, Jimmy, you highlighted their schedule of only playing three games. It didn't seem to hurt them this past weekend, but uh, there's a, there's a, there's a little bit of a, a separation right now between those top three teams, then the next group and then the next group in Atlanta hockey. But that being said, as you know, Ed, anybody can beat anybody on a given night. Um, and I wouldn't, wouldn't uh, I don't know, RIT's got to, they've been so close and we've almost, it's almost been like they've been an, anointed the champion. Now all of a sudden, Holy Cross is sneaking up on them a little bit. And they were always worried about Sacred Heart. And now here's Holy Cross up in second place. But this is where the 11 team league kind of changes things around a little bit. They only have one game left. All right, T's got two. Well, to wrap up, Jim, I'm going to let you uh, highlight this one because you've been so close to the program over the years. Uh, UMass Lowell head coach Norm Bazin with his 300th win on Friday, a nice one, a 4-2 win over Northeastern. And what has been a really difficult season for the River Hawks and one in which uh, I, I imagine there were times where he was wondering whether that number 300 would even come this season. You know, it, it, I think the it was a it was a difficult path to get there. Um, you know, they he's been pretty close. You know, he was at two ninety seven by you know I believe October, um, and then just uh, three wins since then. And in the you know the win over Harvard that got him to two ninety nine was the first week of January. So it did take quite some time five weeks to get that next win. But uh, what a good win to for for the Riverhawks to get too off against Northeastern when Northeastern was coming right off the Beanpot Championship. Uh, four nights later, they head to Lowell and uh, UMass Lowell jumped out to a lead and, and, and didn't look back. And, um, you know, he's a good guy, Norm Bazin. I've, I, you know, he's a we were, uh, classmates at school. He was a couple of years ahead of me, but um, I've worked with him and, and for him uh, in many different roles. Um, great guy. Uh, so congratulations to him, 300th. Uh, there'll be more. There'll be many more. Trust me. This is a team that uh, might have might be going through a down year. But I'll tell you, after watching them Friday night, uh, I wouldn't want to play them in the playoffs in a single elimination tournament. Yeah, I've known Norm since uh, when he was at Colorado College. So I, I'm really excited for Norm. A genuinely good guy. Really good to talk to. What people forget is is Norm almost, we almost lost Norm 
And uh, it was in September, November of 2003. I had to look up the date, but we were both in, in Colorado at that time. He got into a, uh, got hit by a drunk driving, drunk driver while out recruiting. And they actually had to perform last rites. He was in a coma for eight days, a lot of broken bones. It took him an hour to get him out of the wreckage. And um, here he is hit, hitting his 300th win. And uh, you, it couldn't be to a better person, a better guy. So you're you're happy for Norm and, and everything that he's done to, to get 300 wins. So congratulations to, to Norm Bazin on his uh, 300th win. Well, with that, we'll wrap up this edition of USCHO Weekend Review. This podcast is sponsored by the NCAA Men's Division I Frozen Four, April 11th and 13th at XL Energy Center in St. Paul, Minnesota. Visit NCAA.com slash MFrozen4 to get your tickets today. For Jim Connolly and Derek Schooley, I'm Ed Trefsker, and this has been USCHO Weekend Review. 